I felt like it was an answer to prayer, but I also had a response to that, which was, please don't let me hold so tightly to this business that I worship it. Hello and welcome to Beyond Networking, the show where we help you build a sustainable career in an unpredictable world. We believe if you learn to weave a network of people who trust you, who feel heard, understood, and valued in your presence, there will always be someone willing to hire you, buy from you, or work with you. On this show, we feature intimate conversations with legends and leaders of industries about the relationships, connections, and chance encounters that form the foundation of success. Remember to subscribe for world-class insights on how to build a life and career that you are proud of. And join our community at beyondnetworkingpodcast.com. All right, that's it for me. Now it's time to go beyond networking with this week's guest, Sean Askinosi. All right, Sean, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for being here with me today. These are strange times indeed. Yes, pleasure to be here. Wish that it could have been under different circumstances. Yeah, you know, I, th I think so. So you and I were just chatting before we kind of hit record. And um, whereas most of the interviews I've been conducting over the past uh, week or so, uh, we've been conducting as if the current situation wasn't going on. Uh, for those listening, maybe if this is, you know, for all I know, you're listening in 2025, we are in the middle of the uh, the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. And in the States, we're really at the very beginning of it right now. We're, we're kind of two weeks in, depending on where you are. I'm on the Northeast, which means I'm, I'm further into it probably than you are, right? Right. We're in Missouri. So we're, um, as with all things, we're going to flag behind you guys. Well, my proximity to New York City, you know, I'm two hours drive outside of New York City, which was the hot spot on the East Coast, as you, you know, anybody would expect. And uh, it's, yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're pretty much short of a full lockdown right now. It may as well be, you know, it's pretty much just shy of a full lockdown where we are right now. So um, we'll get to that because there's no way to not discuss that. So let, let's start, though, in the place I always like to start. Let's get some context here. So uh, if you are just meeting someone for the first time these days, this year, uh, and they ask, what do you do? How do you answer these days? <clears throat> well, what I do is I make chocolate and I buy cocoa beans around the world and have relationships with people in order to um, live out that business and live out my calling which is making chocolate and working with farmers. Making chocolate and working with farmers. I, I love that. I, I make chocolate. That just, that sounds like the dream job of every <laughs> like six-year-old. I make <laughs> yeah. chocolate. It can be. Uh, well, let's just say in my prior career, when I was a criminal defense lawyer, and when I said that, it wasn't the dream job of, <laughs> of, of pretty much anyone. <laughs> so yeah. Very that different changed. reaction. Very exactly. different reaction, I would yeah. imagine. So so uh, what does it mean to you then to, what does it mean to you to be a, is a chocolatier even the right word? That's probably not really the right word for chocolate what you maker. do. Chocolate, chocolate maker, maker. Mm -hmm. uh, a dream maker, as it were. Uh, mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to be a chocolate maker? Well, for me, what it means is that, um, first of all, it's not my identity. So, um, and I've learned this sometimes the easy way and sometimes the hard way over these years. Um, and by that, I mean, <clears throat> chocolate maker is what I do, but my identity is uh, much deeper than that. And the revelation of my identity is becoming um, more in focus these days as, as it is with many of us, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. So um, what I see um, happening is this, this sort of peeling away of maybe who we think we are um, and who we truly are. And so um, who, I, who I am is much deeper than chocolate maker. Um, but um, my aspiration is, the, is really the, the connection 
to what Thomas Merton would call our true selves. And uh, the closer I can get to my true self um, is my path. That's my path. So how is the current situation then impacting how you see yourself, your understanding of your true self? And I'm especially curious because having listened to your TEDx talk, read your book, and and having heard uh, Seth Godin, of all people, rave about you over and over and over publicly for years, um, I get I got the understanding that you you by now you really had a good firm grasp on your true self. It, is is this situation changing that? Is it is it less firm than you thought, or is it are you doubling down? It's one of the one of the important aspects I think of any path. I don't care what religion or practice um, is one of humility. And so along the path along the path we we Father Richard Rohr says he prays for humiliation every day. And um, I can't say I go that far, but, um, but if we're able to keep um, our humility intact, then we realize that, and I realize for sure, that you know, I may have thought that I was on firm footing um, in, in my work, really uh, pretty intense work over the last 20 years. Um, and I'm finding, okay, um, yes, I, I, I see I see uh, places in this moment of purification, if you will, that um, some some rough spots that I need to um, smooth and work on and observe and uh, be willing to um, sit with. Um, and so um, that's a very, very important part of this. And so what I'm finding is, is that the work that I've done has prepared me for today. We're getting ready to have a shelter in place order. As a food manufacturing business, we're exempt from that. And so I've had to take the last 48 hours and realize that I wanna be a good citizen and um, participate as we can in that order. And um, what this means is that I'm essentially furloughing half of my team here in a couple of hours. Um, so I don't care, I don't care what amount of work you've done, what kind of spiritual practice you think you've had, but there, the, these moments um, are what we've prepared for in many respects our whole lives as we practice. Um, and so we need to rely on our training and that's what I'm doing. But I, what I see in this for my own self is that you know, I've built this business for 15 years. My entire life savings is in it. My, it's a family business. I work with my daughter and um, I see it um, perhaps going away. Um, I don't know. And so I have to, um, and I've always been ready for that. So in the very beginning of this business, I felt like it was an answer to prayer, but I also had a response to that, which was, please don't let me hold so tightly to this business that I worship it. I don't want it to become idol worship. And for all these 15 years, that's been a sort of mantra. Well, <laughs> here I am. We're going to see, we're going to see if that holds true in my practice, that I'm able to let go of it without fighting too much. I want to fight where it's appropriate to fight for my employees, for their well-being for the well-being of my family and my customers and our farmers who we can get to in a minute. But um, yes, but I need to also have the discernment and wisdom to know when and how to surrender. And now this is my, the deepening of my practice. The deepening of my practice is surrender, surrender, surrender. And one of my friends who's very wise yesterday, uh, a former trial lawyer of all things, um, was saying, you know, the thing about this that's happening now is we have no reference point. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very hard. It's very challenging in a, for, in a spiritual practice to surrender when you have no reference point. There's nothing you can point to that says, oh, well, this is how these sort of things happen. You know, if you get divorced or you have a terminal diagnosis or you have, you know, you're just going to lose your business and that's it. You'll start something else. No, this is, this is everything. This is all of those things swirling around in what I call fear soup. Mm -hmm. And there's so many ingredients in it. And so 
how do you surrender? How do you surrender with no reference point? It is a true practice that I think takes us moment by moment. And that's where I am. So I didn't get a lot of sleep last night thinking about all the people that I'm going to have to talk to in a couple of hours. And I, I did this once before in the recession. I know what this feels like. And so while I'm, I'm very distressed by this, I also in the last couple of weeks since this really started unfolding at a rapid pace found that I also have a, a lot of clarity. I had training in this during the recession. I've built 20 years of practice in this. I have a core and essence of who I am as a business person and as a business, which I believe has its own soul um, and is in a way a being in and of itself as a company. And so I need to practice what I've trained to do. And um, that gives me a very high degree of clarity in, the, in these moments. And, and that's what I'm doing. Mm. There's a lot there. Um, the clarity that you have right now, you, you referenced the, uh, the recession, which was one of the only reference points that seems to be coming up over and over again in the public discourse. And, you know, in my world, as I'm chatting with lots of my clients and, you know, you know, CEOs and executives and managers and people who are just like you said, in fear soup right now, because it's it's not just one thing or two things. It's everything in every direction. It's we're looking out for our businesses and our colleagues and our families and our personal lives and our professional lives. Is my career going to sustain this? Does that even matter if my family gets sick? Right? Like just all of these things. Um, why? Why is the recession not really a reference point here? Because of what you just said. There's too many other ingredients in this that weren't there in the recession. Um, really, the recession, the fear at that time in the fall of 2008, when this really hit for Main Street, um, <clears throat> the, the, we, we had to um, lay off employees. But what we were really um, concerned about was demand, lack of demand, um, and access to capital. And so if, if the access to capital problem could be solved, then we could mitigate our fear in that respect. And um, demand generation was something we just had to um, really kind of, um, we had to parse that out. How do we create demand for our product? For me, it wasn't too hard because I, I was thankfully in a place where um, chocolate uh, was an affordable luxury. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to kind of navigate our way through that. And I'm in that spot now too, in some ways. But as you just um, aptly pointed out, there are so many other things happening here. There are many, many other things happening so fast. So, you know, it's not just, it is access to capital. It is demand generation now, but now we also have supply chain and, um, and it's worldwide. The Prime Minister of India just said 1.3 billion people can't leave their homes for three weeks. I mean, so it's worldwide. It's, um, there's, there's really no comparison. And the forecasting for what will happen to our economy in the coming 12 to 24 months is, I mean, you might as well not even read it because yeah. it's, it's, it's dire. And that, all, that just contributes to more fear. And so the final thing I would say is the thing that we didn't have then that we have now is the concern for everybody's health. I mean, this is a devastating virus that kills people. And, you know, at least I didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. I didn't have to worry about my family members dying in 2008. Yeah. So this, I would say that, you know, for this, um, the comparison, you know, that the recession was, you know, kind of elementary school, and now we're getting our PhDs in the management of panic and fear and loss and loss. That's that's what this boils down to. I'm glad you said loss because I, I I've been having this conversation a lot uh, over the past few days, and 
I feel like one of the hardest things, I mean, there's just so many things, but, but, but one of the hardest things about this is the loss of that imagined future, that year I had planned out, the year we thought we were going to have, and not, not the big stuff, but the, the little stuff. So uh, I can say this now because this is officially public as of yesterday. My wife is pregnant with our first, which uh, is a wonderful, thank you, a wonderful, exciting time that has been added on an extra level of anxiety um, in the middle of, of all this, uh, not to mention what it's done to my career as a live event professional who had 15 years of my business decimated overnight, right? I made the pivot. I'm going virtual. We're all going virtual, right? But, but in the middle of it, the questions of all these things, and I was chatting with, with her, and I don't think she'd mind me saying this. I think one of the, the things, apart from the fear for our health and the fear for my business and the fear for all these, our family, one of the things that we're mourning right now is, you know, she was looking forward to shopping for baby clothes with her mom. You know, that's, it doesn't seem like such a big deal, but it's all those little things we thought we were going to do this year that, oh, we're having our first and we had this whole year in our heads. And that's just, it got wiped out and it hasn't been replaced with anything yet. And, and the, it hasn't been replaced with anything yet is, is I think partly that uncertainty is partly what we're all dealing with. So for, for your business, people will still want chocolate, but do you see it worth getting through this for 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 that? Like, are, are how committed are you to to pushing your? You're in a luxury chocolate business. How how committed are you to 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 that? Well, um, my daughter, uh, who's our chief marketing officer and part owner with me, um, is also pregnant. Um, uh, and expect congratulations in August. Thank you. So I, I am with you on this and wow. And I'm with you on this in terms of understanding exactly almost as a grandfather of what you're saying in terms of sharing these moments together and what will these children be born into and, um, that uncertainty compare and combined with these moments that we will not get back. Yeah. This, this, this moment, this, this wish that your wife could shop with her mom will, will not be retrieved that exact moment. And so this, you used a very important word here, and, and that is, I think we need to give ourselves permission to mourn that. I saw a thing today, you know, it's okay to not be okay yeah. and you know i i co-founded a grief center for children 20 years ago called lost and found um, um, really kind of born out of the death of my father when i was 14 and so i still work with these kids where i work with teenagers and we've had thousands of kids and families go through our our program in the last 20 years for free and so i know what grief is i speak that language and people don't ask to learn how to speak that speak the language but they do and um, I understand what, what that is. And I believe that it's important in these times for you and your wife and your family to grieve the loss of those moments and to not, or to not um, force yourselves into sort of placating each other with um, well, it'll be okay, you know, and yes, the, the, yes, these things are true, but it's important, I think, that we name this feeling uh, together collectively as families, as friends, um, as spouses, and that we talk about it and that we don't um, try to, you know, kind of stuff it down someplace. And I think this is very important, and I think we can do it, and I think we can manage it. And I think that not only can we manage it, that we can talk about it and talk with each other, we can love each other, and we can work our way through it. Not to say that it'll all be okay, but as you pointed out, we will find joy. And that I can promise you and your wife and your mother-in-law, 
I can promise you that you will find joy in the midst of this sorrow. Mm -hmm. I promise you will. That leads me, we're, we're on the same wavelength, that leads me right into exactly what I was going to, to ask you about coming out of this is, is we, can, we can slide now into the other side, the, the more positive outlook uh, side of this, which is um, in your book, which, by the way, is fantastic. I really, really enjoyed this. One of my favorite books I've read in a long time. Oh, um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, Meaningful Work, A Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling and Feed Your Soul. Perhaps more important over the next six, eight months as people lose their businesses and their restaurants um, than ever before. Um, in your book and in your TEDx talk, you spoke um, deeply and over and over again about the about joy being the other side of sorrow, and it reminded me of something that um, my friend Peter Gazzardi, uh, he's the kind of famous book editor, kind of book editor to the stars. Uh, he was on last season of the podcast, and I had this wonderful conversation with him. And he said, "Authors always write the book that they need to read, and <laughs> preachers always give the sermon they need to hear." That's so, so. <laughs> so Take me through this sorrow leading to joy. Where, where does this come from and what can we do now? Khalil Gibran said, our greatest joy is our sorrow unmasked. Say it again. Our greatest joy is our sorrow unmasked. And for your viewers and listeners um, who might have thought two months ago, well, I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot of sorrow in my life. You know, I don't. I believe me, I've had people at conferences and stuff say, well, I don't really get what you're saying. I'm 40 and I haven't really had any sorrow. Well, you probably do now. Yeah. And you're going to have a chance to see what this means that um, you can have this joy by unmasking your sorrow. And so this is what I needed. It's what I needed. Um, for myself as I was searching for my next thing to do after I couldn't, you know, practice law anymore. I just couldn't handle it um, for a variety of reasons. Did it for 20 years. Mm. Um, but I believe that um, between sorrow and joy, um, there is this place that John O'Donohue calls a threshold. He writes a lot poet philosopher John O'Donohue writes a lot about this notion of threshold and it can be a lot of things. So between careers, um, between relationships, um, and now we are now in the greatest threshold collectively of perhaps the last 150 years. Yeah. And, um, this is this threshold is very, very unsettling. So if we can allow ourselves to do what we said at the beginning of the episode, if we can practice in small measures this notion of surrender, um, then we can find within that moments of joy because the the action of surrender allows the opportunity for joy to fill that space. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard because we're all, we're breathing from here up right now. Yeah. So the first thing I, I try to talk to people to do is just people I talk to who maybe have not had a practice for 20 years or 10 years or five years who are really panicking and really in fear. I'm like, just let's breathe together. Mm. Let's just take some deep breaths. You know, let's take some deep breaths. And um, we know that there's no fear in the present moment. It's not there. The past, yes. Future, yes. There's no fear in the present moment, which also means that if we can surrender that, we can find a lot of joy in the present moment. Mm -hmm. We can also look to other examples around us. We know historically, we know with friends and other family members, who've been through a real struggle, but we have found them to be 
almost kind of like miraculously joyful. How, how is that? How could that be? And I think the one of the sort of mysteries of this, the mystery of this, when we don't have money, you know, maybe we don't get to take the perfect vacation. Um, we don't get to do the things that we were hoping to do. But one thing that we can always do that takes no money is we can serve someone else who needs us. And what I have found is that it's, it's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. But if you are struggling and you take a moment to breathe deep and you ask the universe or your God, is there someone that you can send me who needs me that I can serve? And maybe they're in my own house. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's in my, my own family. Then there's this place of joy that we can find just by serving someone else in our own sorrow. It's a mystery, you know, and I talk about this in my TEDx, you know, Gandhi said, if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. Well, it's, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. I've had a, I've had a really, really tough 48 hours. And last week, the farmers that I work with in Africa that I've been working with for over a decade, I've been going there every year. We just opened a preschool there. We've had all kinds of projects there. I bring high school kids there every other year. Our trip just got canceled with our high school students yesterday. They, they were worried about me. These are very, very poor, very poor farmers who uh, many of them live in straw huts, mud floors, no electricity, nothing. But there's, there's 60 farmers in this group and they wanted to know how I was. So through our field rep last week, they contacted me on WhatsApp and they, and they said, we want to know how you are. We're worried about you. Me, they're worried about me in, in the midst of all the coronavirus. So they said, please send us a video. So I sent them a video uh, in the factory, picture of me eating their, you know, video of me eating the, the chocolate from Tanzania. <laughs> and yesterday they sent me a WhatsApp video with the leaders of their group talking to me saying hello, saying they can't wait to see me. And they were smiling and laughing. Can you imagine the joy that I felt yesterday when I got that WhatsApp video, mm. the tears just streaming down my face from that? Yeah. It lifted, it just, it just lifted me up. It just, it, it was like, it was like my feet were off the ground yeah. and it, it was joy right in the middle of all of this. And that's what I'm saying. If we can build relationships, we're going to find in the midst of these relationships, in the midst of helping each other, real acts of helping each other, um, we're going to find immeasurable joy that we did not know we could experience, especially without money or things or all that stuff. It's going to happen. It will happen. That's such a great and such a powerful example. Um, I a few folks asked me, you know, a week or so ago for kind of advice, like, what do I do right now? You know, a lot of my friends and colleagues are like I am. They're in the they're either entertainers or they're speakers. The live event industry just collapsed in the span of about twenty four hours mm -hmm. worldwide, right? Yeah. Unprecedented, yeah. like everything else. Yeah. Um, and no idea when it's coming back. People keep rescheduling events for the fall and then we're going to have to reschedule those for the spring and then we're going to have to reschedule right who knows so a lot of folks were asking me you know what do i do right now and i said well in the moment one of the things you can do that costs nothing that you can do with all the time you have is every book you've read in the last six months that you loved every podcast you listen to on a regular basis that you love all those blogs you subscribe to that give you joy Go write a review on Amazon for all those books. Go leave a review on Apple Podcasts for all those podcasts. Go 
reply to that blog. There's a human being on the other end of that blog that you get every week. Flood the people that give you joy with some joy right now because mm -hmm. they're in the same boat as we are. And that doesn't That's cost right. anything. Exactly. I love that idea. So let's um let's let's talk about a really I I, I want to talk about this really cool thing in in the book that um you know, because businesses will, at some point, business will continue. It will be different. I'm not mm -hmm. sure the working world will ever look the same again, mm -hmm. but business will continue and we will need to keep up good practices. And the core of this book and everything you talk about will all continue to be just as relevant. It will just look different on the outside. And so I was really moved by your celebration of work adversaries. Um, I loved that. Can you describe that for uh, for us? Sure. The, um, the, well, it's in the context of a huddle and we have huddles every week and um, we, we practice open book management. So we talk about all the finances and all of that. So everybody kind of knows where we are financially, um, which is helping a lot now, by the way, um, because mm -hmm. we share all the numbers. Um, but when it's someone's work anniversary, we will um, have that person um, sit in the front of our small group and we go around the room and we speak directly to that person and say what we love about them or what we admire about them or appreciate about them. And these words are straight from the person and received by the person whose work anniversary it is. And it's very, very powerful, very emotionally moving. And um, it's, you know, just, it's an amazing practice that I, I think. Um, I think many people, you know, it doesn't cost anything yeah. um, to do that. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And that's a practice that right now, any of the managers and execs and kind of those <laughs> folks that listen to this podcast um, that I've worked with over the years have met me over the years. You can do that virtually. There's no reason right now you can't be leaning into practices like that. Absolutely. I mean, well, there are all sorts of things. I mean, you know, we talk about in the book, a Gemba walk, you know, in the, in, in the book, mm -hmm. the Japanese principle of people walking through the factory and checking with employees, you know, one by one, how's it going? What are you doing? What are you working on? And just engaging in some conversation. Well, I can't do that right now, but mm -hmm. I can do it virtually. Right. I can ask people, I can make small talk and check in with them. Um, and I predict that if people do this right, and I think many will, that, they're going to find deeper connections with employees, even virtually, than they did if they were, you know, ten feet away, because they're going to be mindful of the importance right. of doing this now more than ever. Right, right, right. The 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 video chat is not the point, right? Mm -hmm. I think, right. I what what's happened over the last two weeks has been fascinating. Where it seems that for some like someone like me, like what we're doing right now, this is a part of my daily work life for years. I mean, I have clients all over the world. I do this all the time, but. A lot of folks are discovering, it seems, video chatting like <laughs> right now. Um, and I feel like the first week of it, the video itself, just the technology itself was standing in for connection. It, it was just in and of itself. But that will wear out, right, after a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. And then it's just a new medium to double down on the things that really matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, we're finding it in our own organization. You know, we didn't have to use zoom before we use skype with farmers around the world but that's great for everybody meeting on on zoom it's it's kind of it's new for us because we're so small but yeah yeah it's happening yeah yeah it's great so um i uh i want to get you to to tell me a story everybody who comes on the podcast regardless of what's going on in the world at the time everybody comes on and tells me a story of a chance encounter uh that happened at some point in their life, do you have a uh, do you have a good story for us? You're full of you're full of good stories. I have a lot of stories. Um, well, um, a while back, we were taking a group of students to Tanzania, and these are students from Southwest Missouri, uh, juniors and seniors in high school, super smart, um, but many of them have never traveled before. Um, so because. More than half of them are scholarship. We pay for it. We have a program called yeah. Chocolate University um, in, in my factory. And um, so super bright kids, 
never been anywhere, some never been on a plane, takes us almost 60 hours to get where we're going in Tanzania, so they're tired. Um, the, and, and I explained to them, hey, when you get to Dar es Salaam, it's not gonna look like Springfield, it won't smell like Springfield, not, the cars go the other on the other side of the street. Um, the food's not like Springfield. And then when we take the puddle jumper over to Mbeya, then we get on a little bus and we go to the village. The next morning, the students are super tired they're just their senses are just completely bombarded and we get on this little rickety van bus there's 20 of us and we're making our way to this little high school where we have a school lunch program where we're feeding a thousand kids a day who have only one meal a day wow. um, and so we have quite a relationship with the students and faculty at this school well as our bus pulls up on this little gravel road all of the students are just streaming out. So there's, there's a thousand students streaming out of the school, coming toward our bus, all in their blue and white uniforms. We get off of the bus and the students from Tanzania are singing in English, we're happy, we're happy to be together, we are happy, we're happy to be together. Just very simple little song and tune. And they enveloped our our group and you, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's like where you go somewhere for Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. And, and people come out to greet you on the driveway, uh, except this time it's a thousand people coming to greet us. So you you have a good feeling, even if two people come to say hello to you, they're like, Hey, they're happy to see me. Well, it's, it's, it's quite a thing when that, when it's magnified that by that, I wasn't ready for it. I've been to Africa many times. Um, and there wasn't a dry eye in our group. They just enveloped our group of 20. Everybody was tearful, but it was a happy song. Uh -huh. What is going on there? I wasn't, uh, like I said, I wasn't prepared for it. Neither were, neither were any of them. Hmm. Well, what was happening was just an overwhelming amount of hospitality. We just couldn't take it. As humans, we're not built for it. We are not built for it. I don't care who you are, um, where you've traveled, um, but I wasn't built for it. And so the chance encounter part of it was really just, just magnified. Mm -hmm. I, I, could, I can think back and put myself in that moment immediately because what I began to realize is, well, maybe I'm going to get off of a bus, you know, when I die and there'll be people uh, there and I bet that's what heaven's like. Mm -hmm. And then what I realized after, you know, thinking about this for months and years is that it's not what heaven's going to be like. It was heaven for me. I can't interpret how it was for the other students or anybody else, but I'm saying for me, it was an encounter with the divine. Mm. Just, these are just poor students coming down a gravel drive and greeting our group. And I had an encounter with the divine. That's, I mean, what, what more can you ask for? What more could you possibly ask for? And here's what I, what I, what I would say. Someday my business is going to end and it might be in a few months. It might be in 20 years. I don't know. It could be when I least expect it, but that experience and that encounter is never going away. It will, it will reside with me here as it does now, and it will go with me into the next life. It's part of me. Mm. It's part of my true self that I spoke of at the beginning of your show. Yeah. That's what it is. So it's like the penultimate chance encounter for mm. me, and it's available to anyone, anybody, at any time. That's wonderful. What a story. I can, I, I can, I can't experience that, but I can, I can, I can imagine even just, you know, I'm just thinking about when we come out the other side of what we're in right now, just going to see family, like on a normal visit for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, in three, six, 10, 12 months. Uh, or longer, um, just being able to do that, how how that's going to be. So I, I, I'm imagining that being magnified by just this overwhelming. Um, so 
one of the through lines in this whole conversation, I want to start to pull this in. One of the through lines has really been this, this kind of principle of non-attachment. It's very Eastern philosophy that, mm-hmm. that, that you've, yeah. uh, that you've got here. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, and I identify with that a lot because I'm not conventionally religious. Um, but I, I have a philosophy degree, um, and abandoned cool. ship, uh, abandoned ship right as I was about to do a PhD in analytic metaphysics. What in the wow. world would, would my life have been like? I was like, no card tricks instead. Um, <laughs> so, it. it was a it. strange pivot point. Uh, but I, I remain to this day, um, uh, I love philosophy and I love all reading. And, and, and I grew up half Roman Catholic and the other half, well, so half my family was 100% Long Island uh, Roman Catholic and, and the other half was uh, Long Island Jewish, 100% Jewish. So mm-hmm. Jewish, and one but then in, in college, I studied Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism as part of my philosophy degree. And I really really just grasped and, 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 and felt, I felt a deeper connection to the Eastern uh, religions and they're, they're more cultures than they are religions, um, kind mm-hmm. of ways of life. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that you've followed through this whole thing is you haven't been too attached when your previous career as an attorney and you were wildly successful, like monumentally successful as an attorney, when that wasn't working for, your, for you anymore, you let it go. You walked away. Very few people can walk away from that level of success, from the security. And now you're describing this unbelievable business that even just a few weeks ago when you and I first met, we were all excited to jump on and talk about your Mm -hmm. chocolate business. Now you're staring down the possibility of having to let that go. But you and the core of you and the core of what was in that business will remain. So a lot of my audience are young professionals, young adults, 22 to 35, and in normal times, this show is designed to help them navigate a sustainable career in an unpredictable world. I never realized how much the unpredictable component was going to come into play. Uh, You regularly say, follow your dreams is not helpful advice. I couldn't agree with you more. So right now, in these times, what piece of advice would you offer to a young person? a young professional, someone who hasn't had the luxury that you've had of building a successful career already. I've had the luxury, I've had the great luck probably of just by happenstance, I'm 15 years into a career, I've proven something, I can make a pivot right now. Not everybody can make that pivot I'm about to make. What would you tell a young person right now about building a sustainable career? I would say to that young person that there might not be a thing called a sustainable career and to accept that and to take this opportunity to um, to practice breathing and to practice letting go as a moment by moment, day by day, um, Um, effort and that by doing so you will receive clarity uh, that you might not find in other places that will in a sense be your guide the space that you open up by surrendering and letting go will be filled with um, creativity imagination inspiration that you might not have been previously aware of if you'll let yourself do this. Mm. And I would say to the young person now, maybe in their mid twenties or late twenties, and they're, they're facing the prospect of not just being furloughed or laid off, but it could be the end of this job that they've had for a few years or five years. And they love this job. And maybe you, You hoped for this career that would go on and on in this particular business or industry. And what I would say to you, young person, is I suspect that there was some measure of beauty that brought you to this place to begin with. And I would encourage you to find the same measure of beauty as you lay this down. As you lay it down and let it go, do that 
and behave in a way that exhibits some measure of balanced beauty with which you started this thing maybe a few years ago and learn from that and begin the next thing with beauty and lay it down with beauty and you'll be okay. You'll be okay. It's great, great, great advice. Um, I really appreciate that. So before we bring this in and I ask you kind of one final question to tie everything together. First of all, where do you want people to find you? Where do you want people to connect with you? Askanosi.com is a place where they can buy chocolate and we ship all over the country. And thankfully we're still doing that and we're making chocolate and shipping it everywhere. So that would be great. Um, great. That's, that's good. So you are, you are currently still shipping. Yes. We're okay. still shipping, still making chocolate with a very, very small crew. And um, wow. we're doing that and sending it all over the place. And so, yeah, that would be the biggest thing. And then I have a blog that I occasionally am on at seanaskinosi.com, but um, the, I'm easy to find. Um, my book is easy to find, Meaningful Work. And um, I'm, I'm easy to find at our website so people can reach me and or my website, seanaskinosi.com, if they want to have a conversation. I'm, I'm open to that. Great. And so I, I'm going to leave all the links in the show notes, including a link to Seth's episode of Akimbo that I mean, you got an entire episode of Akimbo dedicated to you and your business. That That is some honor, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what we did to deserve that, but I'll take it. He's a good friend. <laughs> um, so, and, 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 and definitely anybody who's listening. So I've had the pleasure of enjoying uh, three different chocolate bars from you. Thank you for the, the kind care package. My wife and I really enjoyed it. Uh, we had different ones that we enjoyed. Um, uh, uh, she loved the coconut. Uh, she mm -hmm. loved, and I, I enjoyed it as well. I, I'm a, I'm big on the orange chocolate though. I was oh, a I big fan. Yeah. Have you ever done raspberry chocolate? Yes, we have. In fact, it just won a good food award. We do it with American spoon, uh, jam makers in Northern Michigan. And uh -huh. we have a raspberry chocolate that is like, we can't even keep it in stock. So, oh my yes, goodness, we do. that's see raspberry is my thing. I'll have yeah. to be getting some. So yes. I would say to anyone, not go get it for yourself. Cause we all need something really nice to enjoy. Uh, and we, we can still treat ourselves in, in these times, but you could also turn it around and be that source of joy and just send some of this chocolate to someone else as a gift right now. I've done it in nice. the past with your chocolate as well. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. We've been sending it, um, to, um, our local ER, emergency room departments and ICU staffs just sending a bunch of chocolate to those that's places great. so they can enjoy it. That's great. That's, that's really, really great. Um, so let me, let's end with this today. What are you most grateful for right now? Um, I'm, I'm most grateful for um, just right now. Like I'm grateful for this opportunity I'm grateful to have the chance to talk to you and to, to be grateful for your questions and the chance for these words that we're speaking to be released into the universe in hopes that we can do our part to, to talk to people's hearts and to minimize as best we can their fear. I'm grateful for that. Wonderful. Is there anything else, since we're in these unprecedented times, anything else you'd like to, oh, look at that. There you go. This is my bumper sticker. It's my favorite scripture verse. Perfect love drives out fear. This is, this is it. Just love is greater than fear. We just need to, we just need to remember that. We need to breathe that in and out. And, and it, 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 it always works. It's the truth. Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today and uh, and speaking so um, openly about what you're going through in the moment. I, I think there's a lot of uh, business leaders uh, right now who need to hear somebody um, openly talking about the fear itself and not dancing around it with it's going to be okay and if only we do this and the money that and mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this this it's a it's it's a scary time and i mm -hmm. think we can all admit that mm -hmm. and uh 
And I, I, I really appreciate your conversation today. So oh, thank you, Brian. Sean, thank you so much for, for doing this. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you. And congratulations to you and your family. Yes. And to you as well. It's so thank exciting. You. It is yes. exciting. <laughs> yes. Thank you for having me and, and God be with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Well, that was intense. But I also found it cathartic to talk through the fear soup with someone as collected as Sean. So before you order yourself a couple of bars of fabulous Askinosi chocolate, here are a few takeaways from this episode. First, as much as we should put our whole selves into our work, it's important to distinguish who we are from what we do. This also came up in Season 2, Episode 9 with Jay Reynolds, the famous ESPN broadcast journalist. Here, Sean gives us a mantra to live by. Please don't let me hold so tightly to this business that I worship it. Everything is changing right now, and the sooner you let go of the idea you had in your head of where your career was heading, the sooner you can make something new. Second, and on a related note, we should give ourselves permission to mourn. Not just mourn lost lives or dollars, but that imagined future we will never get to realize. It's okay to be sad, and it's okay not to be okay for a while. And finally, if you're ready to turn the corner on your sorrow and transform it into joy, start by serving others. What generous act can you create today? Because that's where joy is. Head to the show notes on beyondnetworkingpodcast.com for links to order from Askinosi chocolate for yourself or others. Seriously, I just ate some before recording. It will instantly make you feel better. Or to connect with Sean himself. You'll also find related links from this conversation, including the episode of Seth Godin's Akimbo all about Sean's work, uh, his book, and his TEDx talk. And now for some announcements. The podcast is going weekly. Woohoo! At least for a while. With no travel or live events for the foreseeable future, I'm running my entire business virtually out of my home office and studio which means I've got plenty of time to record, edit, and upload the podcast, so we're ramping up production. You can expect a new in-depth conversation every single Monday. Be sure to subscribe via your favorite streaming service or hop on the community email list at beyondnetworkingpodcast.com. And lastly, on that note, I'm launching a public leadership mastermind. I run private masterminds for managers and executives, for freelancers and entrepreneurs, and aspiring TEDx speakers, but for the first time, I'm opening one to the public. The world changed overnight, forever. Someone is going to write the new rules. Someone is going to lead the rest of us into the new world. Shouldn't it be you? When have you ever had a chance to be on the first wave of a completely new era? In May of 2020, I'll open just a few slots for an exclusive public mastermind. We'll have a monthly group video session, plus each member will get a one-on-one 30-minute chat with me every month. Plus, you'll get access to a private Facebook group to share resources and learn from each other. All of us are stronger than any of us. Head to brianmillerspeaks.com slash join or click the appropriate link in the show notes of this episode to get on the public wait list. And you'll be among the first notified when these small amount of slots open up. Take a listen to what some of my students have to say. Until I met Brian, it's safe to say I never had a good video conference. The technology was there, but the connection wasn't. Brian has a way about him that he can facilitate a meeting that makes everyone feel special and important at the same time, he asks these amazing questions that get you thinking in a way that you just never would on your own. He made me feel comfortable from day one. He lifted up my confidence and his sessions were so focused and so productive that it didn't even take that much time with him to get me to the place that I needed to be. Uh, I've worked with Brian over the last several months, in fact almost a year now we've been uh, working together 
and he's been absolutely fantastic uh, and he's just a super guy and couldn't recommend him more highly. And let me just tell you, when I reached out to Brian the first time, I could tell that this guy is so genuine, knows his stuff. I mean, hello, TEDx with over 3 million views. Get on a call with this man and work with him because it is the best investment you could possibly make at one of the most important milestones in your career. So Brian, thank you so much for such an amazing experience. You're an incredible, incredible coach, and I'm so fortunate to have worked with you. I can't wait to see what you bring to the table. So again, brianmillerspeaks.com slash join or click the appropriate link in the show notes of this episode. That said, my name is Brian Miller. This is Beyond Networking, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.